since we're in the midst of the holidays, we just wanted to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. In lieu of the season, perhaps we'll draw that jolly old elf Saint Nick. Many of you are probably sick of zombies, so we're going to draw one anyway. But first, a skull. Welcome to Anatomy 101. Let's get cracking. No pun intended. Step one, lay out a rough sketch, emphasis on rough. Draw a semicircle, cheekbones, eye sockets, and nasal cavity. Then the lower jaw area, giving a general mandible shape. As you can see, it's quite a loose drawing at this point. Not perfect, but not too far off. Depending on what you're going for, it might be okay to use these Halloween prop skulls and skeletons as drawing reference, but most of them are not anatomically accurate for realistic renderings. Some are closer than others. One of the major problems with this particular skull is the back of the cranium should end about halfway between the top of the head and the chin, whereas this goes all the way down so it can sit on a table. So I would suggest digging up a corpse yourself, perhaps a relative, you know, for study and educational purposes. Just kidding, that's illegal and a little gross. I would, however, suggest looking through a few anatomy books to get your bearings on what goes where, but I think it's also important to note that no two skulls look exactly alike, just like no two people look exactly alike. Identical twins. After watching a few zombie films, I've come to the conclusion that I would be a cameraman in the event of a zombie apocalypse. They never seem to get those guys. May as well throw in a hand here for good measure. Beyond the humerus, or upper arm bone, we have the ulna and radius, or forearm bones. Then at the wrist, we've got our carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges, or finger bones. Next, we'll refine our line placement and go in and add more detail. It's good to observe several different images or models of skulls as reference, as it's always helpful to get more than one point of view. Play with your line thickness. I generally like to use heavier, darker lines in shadowed areas and thinner, lighter line work in areas of highlight or brighter values. That means you get to think about a light source, unless, of course, you're going for a cartoon or stylized looking skull. The jaw area at the joint is quite complex, so pay close attention to not only how your reference material looks, but how the bones work. Like a door on a hinge. But not really. 
Don't necessarily just trace over the lines of your underdrawing, but rather redraw those lines, continually improving the shapes beyond your earlier sketch. Pay attention to not only the outer lines, but look at the lines within the bones and at the teeth. The eye sockets and nasal cavity are more than black gaping holes, and those inner details will become important as we begin to add rotted flesh later. If you need to, observe your own fingers and hands as you work, especially when we go in and actually add flesh to them. To make this a more realistic head, we'll lightly shade our skull to add dimension, like so, keeping in mind our light source and where it hits or hides the light. When I draw skulls, I'm not really thinking about the face, because they're quite different things. But obviously, when you're drawing a face, it's useful to think of the underlying skull. The face is built over the skull, unless, of course, you're a sculptor making a mask. Step four, add fleshy features. Eyes, part of the nose, part of the mouth, etc. So we have our basic skull here, and we're going to turn it into a zombie. When drawing the eyes into the ethmoid bone sockets, don't think of them as circles or football shapes. Think of them as spheres. The eyelids wrap over and under them accordingly. The nose, which is made mostly of cartilage, might have rotted away or partially eroded over the course of two years walking as a corpse. So we'll emphasize the edge of the nasal bone and the sunken flesh inside. The lips too may have cracked and peeled off slightly so we can bring in a bit of gore around the mouth. Zombies are infamous for scratches, cuts, fleshy craters, and missing parts, so just have fun with it at this point and tell the story of this poor soul through the condition of their remaining flesh. First you have to ask, what's the zombie's story? Who is he or she? How old? How long ago did they get bit? Exactly how long have they been undead? Let's make our zombie female, middle-aged, brought in a good couple of years. Step 5. Throw in some hair and refine gory details. Rotting flesh is mostly about the placement and intensity of highlights and shadows. It's all about fooling the eye and creating the illusion of three-dimensionality. masks and costumes as a kid, I think every child should. We're getting a bit lazy nowadays, running to the store for pre-made costumes wrapped in plastic. I guess moms just don't have the time to sew or teach their kids paper mache or plaster molds anymore. Shame. I was actually born in 1980, which technically makes me a millennial. I've heard it said that millennials are better prepared for a zombie invasion than an hour without electricity. That's probably pretty accurate. In refining the gory details of your dead man or woman walking, simply touch up the highlights and shadows according to the direction from which your imaginary light hits your subject. In her case, we have our light source coming from the left.
know what's strange? When in zombie movies, people act like they've never seen zombie movies. Why are there sometimes stitch marks on zombies? Who is giving them medical attention? Think of your work here as applying special effects and makeup art over your very cooperative skeleton actor. He's been so great at holding still for us while we finish up. Big gurgling round of snarls, growls, and groans for our walker. This is how you draw the dead. <laughs> 